Hello everyone, welcome to the Street Crime UK YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more content. Today we look at one of the most ruthless criminals to ever exist in the UK criminal underworld. A man who has found success as a professional UFC fighter but went on to commit one of the biggest cash robberies that has ever been committed in the UK to this day. Lee Brahim Murray Lamrani was born on the 12th of November in 1977 and is an English and Moroccan mixed martial arts fighter and convicted criminal. In 2005, Lee Murray's MMA career was cut short after Mr. Murray was stabbed multiple times outside a Mayfair nightclub in a sustained brutal attack. Mr. Murray was arrested in Rabat, Morocco in the June of 2006 and was sentenced to 10 years in prison in June 2010. This was for masterminding the armed Securitas Depot robbery in Kent, England, where he took just shy of £54 million or £53,116,760 to be exact of cash banknotes that belonged to the Bank of England and were stolen by Mr Murray and his criminal associates during a robbery which took place on the 22nd of February in 2006. It was, at the time of being committed, the largest known cash robbery that had ever been successfully executed in the world during peacetime. After a failed attempt to escape prison and a failed appeal to reduce his sentence, Mr. Murray's jail term was extended to a further 25 years on the 30th of November 2010. The cage fighting crime boss Mr. Murray, who is behind the £53 million Securitas money heist, has been moved to a high security unit in the prison he resides and stripped of all his prison luxuries. This comes after local newspapers revealed that Mr. Murray, who is behind bars in Morocco on drug charges, fathered a child behind bars. Prison chiefs were furious after learning that Mr. Murray flouted rules by sleeping with a woman visitor who it was revealed was not his wife. Mr. Murray was moved to a tougher unit of Kinatra Prison near Rabat, and his mobile phone, television and DVDs were all confiscated as a punishment. It was also reported that Mr. Murray's right to have visitors has been withdrawn. A close source to Mr. Murray's family said, Mr. Murray's life in prison is very different to how it used to be. The story about the baby has not gone down well among powers that be in Moroccan prison, and guards are said to be keeping an even closer eye now on Mr. Murray and his activities. In an interview from his hell for a martial arts magazine in 2009, Mr. Murray revealed that he could watch TV, DVDs and even pornography. And Mr. Murray said that he had been rewarded for good behaviour, saying if you're good you get special shit. Mr. Murray was later punished for making the comments in the magazine by being made to spend extra time in solitary confinement. Mr. Murray has been in jail since 2006. This was months after he led the biggest heist in British history in Tonbridge, Kent. Mr. Murray had organised the armed raid with military precision and ensured the gang left the depot after being on site for less than an hour. Mr. Murray inadvertently provided key evidence for police when he had crashed his car shortly before the robbery and fled the scene leaving his mobile phone in the vehicle. He accidentally pressed the record button on the handset during a conversation about the robbery with fellow plotter Leah Russia, who was later recovered and used by prosecutors during his trial. On the night of the raid, 14 Securitas staff members were terrorised and tied up at gunpoint as the robbers loaded the cash onto a lorry. In 2018, Mr. Murray, in an interview, stated he was training to fight in prison and still planned a UFC comeback, with the hope of securing a pardon from the then King Mohammed VI of Morocco. UFC President Dana White commented on Mr. Murray, saying that he's a scary son of a bitch, and I don't mean fighter-wise. Mr. Murray's mother, Barbara Murray, the side of the family hails from Bermondsey, a densely populated semi-Docklands part of South London between Tower Bridge and the Old Kent Road, much of which is known as a traditional breeding ground for up-and-coming professional criminals, especially armed robbers. Following World War II, the Murrays were among thousands of working-class families that were relocated from bomb-ravaged inner London to council estates that were situated further out. The Murray home was 6 Godstow Road in Abbeywood between Shooters Hill, a road that was so named possibly because it was once a notorious area for a highway robbery and the River Thames in the ESE of London. Barbara, Mr Murray's mother, was a hairdresser and later on in life became a telephonist, which is a switchboard telephone operator. On a holiday to Grand Canaria, Barbara met Lee's father, 
Brahim Lamrani, a kitchen hand from the southern Moroccan city of Sidi Imfni. The couple's first child, Lee would be born in St. Nicholas Hospital, Plumstead on the 12th of November 1977, and a young Mr. Murray was initially raised by his mother, while Brahim, his father, continued to live and work in the Canary Islands to make money. Eventually, Brahim came to England to join his family and married Barbara in 1984, and in 1985, Barbara gave birth to Lee's only sibling, Rukia. By then, the family had moved to a nearby 11 Butt Marsh Close, Plumstead, and a young Mr. Murray had attended Foxfield Primary School, where Lee would meet his future wife, Siobhan Rowlings, who was three years his junior. Mr. Murray's closest associates at this point were boys from Buttmarsh and the surrounding estates who had called themselves the Buttmarsh Boys. The boys were described as happy kids who used to play like normal kids on the estate. The young lads often fought to establish an internal pecking order within the gang and believed that they had a duty to look after Buttmarsh, even if this meant sometimes engaging in fights with boys from neighbouring estates over turf. As he was only a skinny youngster, Mr. Murray's preferred method of attack was running into battle, windmilling his arms around his head with a manic expression on his face. This was a manoeuvre which, combined with his protruding ears, earned Mr. Murray the nickname of Alien, which Mr. Murray himself hated. It was also around this time that Mr. Murray was having a difficult relationship with his father, who often was drunk and described as a frightening violent man who was volatile and domineering in his presence. Largely absent from the first seven years of Mr. Murray's life, Braham demanded Lee's respect and obedience. He felt that he deserved this from his son, to the point where a police warning was issued for his mistreatment. Eventually, Mr. Murray, learning that he had the ability to fight, began to fight back against his father. The next door neighbour heard that Mr. Lamrani actually went and hit Lee once, and Lee had had enough and snapped. He just turned around and knocked his dad clean out. Once Mr. Murray realised he could take down a big man like that, I think that's what changed Lee into the man he later became. Their relationship became so tempestuous that Mr. Brahim felt living together would result in death, and so Mr. Brahim decided that he would move out. Barbara was then left to raise Lee and Rukia largely on her own, and moved back to Abbeywood Estate, to a council house on Grove Street Road, around the corner from Barbara's parents. It was at this time Mr. Murray began attending Eaglesfield Boys School, which is where Mr. Murray would meet his eventual best friend and a man who would later become his partner in crime, Mr. Paul Allen. Mr. Murray, who enjoyed reading and puzzles as a youth, was described as a subpar student, mainly doing well in football but failing to make the school team. Teachers found Mr. Murray's temper unmanageable and he was expelled from Eaglesfield Boys School and found enrolment at Woolwich Polytechnic School to complete the statutory years of school that was required of him. By this time, Mr. Murray was living life on the streets, with stealing and drug dealing becoming a part of his everyday activity. Mr. Murray and the Buttmarsh boys were allegedly in daily contact with Nigerian drug dealers who operated at Plumstead train station and an eventual turf war broke out over control that saw Mr. Murray and his friends win a local territory in which was immensely profitable for drug trading. However, it was only a matter of time until Mr. Murray would eventually be convicted of possession of cocaine and cannabis, and was named in the Old Bailey as a notorious London drug dealer who employed Paul Allen as his right-hand man. This was along with a network of drug runners in which he employed to carry out their dealings across the city. One of Mr. Murray's best friends from this time was a local ruffian and future mixed martial artist who went by the name of Mark the Beast Epstein. Mr. Epstein claimed that he and Mr. Murray sold crack cocaine together and that he could confirm that Mr. Murray had already made a substantial amount of money from that. Mr. Murray also proved himself to be more adept at the violent side that was sometimes needed in the selling of drugs. This violence would be typically used to control territory they were making money in from rival gangs and to make sure customers and dealers who took large amounts of drugs on credit actually have a reason to pay up. Mr. Murray himself claimed that some people would probably say I was a bully during my time in the drug game, but a bully to me is someone that goes for easy targets and people who can't or won't fight back. Me, I went for all the targets in my path. Mr. Murray was known for punching people almost at random in the streets when he was on a rampage. This was as well as habitually harassing a man who ran a local corner shop where his gang worked. Mr. Murray was sentenced to a term at Feltham Young Offenders Institution. This would be the first of his custodial sentences. He would go on to receive for some of Mr. Murray's more minor offences, which included assault and thievery. 
the custodial sentences followed in Dover and Norwich prisons institutions. Upon emerging from Feltham, Mr Murray devoted all of his energy to the gym. He spent time lifting weights and drinking as many weight gain shakes as possible to try and add bulk to his at the time lanky 6 foot 3 frame. Joining Mr Murray was Mr Allen, who by then was known as the Enforcer, presumably from his drug dealing activity alongside Mr Murray. Mr Murray and Mr Allen were soon using steroids to gain even more physical mass and spending the money they earned from selling drugs on extravagant luxury cars, jewellery and living the high life. The police stopped Mr Murray regularly in his flash cars and designer outfits and because they suspected and had intelligence that Mr Murray was a drug dealer, the police had attempted to place an informer in Mr Murray's gang but could not get enough evidence to prosecute Mr Murray of selling drugs. Mr Murray was contemptuous of the police, often mocking and intimidating them on the streets, sometimes following police officers around in his car. Some officers at Plumstead Police Station had told other officers that they felt wary, and it was said that it was best not to aggravate Mr Murray, as it was becoming common knowledge that he was a very dangerous man. Mr Murray's girlfriend, Siobhan, gave birth to her first child, Lily Jane, on the 24th of September in 1998. Weeks later, Mr Murray was caught up in a turf war with rival drug dealers. This was one that led to the arrest of Mr Epstein and more than a dozen other dealers, many ending up having to spend a considerable amount of time in prison. Mr Murray, however, got away clean, with Mr Epstein saying that it was like he was the only one that somehow managed to slip through the net. I mean he is a lucky boy, he's always been lucky, but not me, I went to prison for three years. After escaping the police who had arrested the majority of his organisation, Mr Murray decided it was time to marry his girlfriend Siobhan on the 24th of November 2000, listing himself on their wedding certificate as a professional fighter. However, due to the actions Mr Murray decided to take later on his career, he would then divorce Siobhan in 2008 while incarcerated in a Moroccan jail. Shortly after dodging arrest, Mr Murray was introduced to mixed martial arts and found it was something that he enjoyed. And he competed in his first fight on the 5th of December in 1999 at an event called Millennium Brawl and the event was held at Hemel Hempstead Pavilion. Mr Murray's opponent during the fight was a Rob Hudson and Mr Murray knocked him out in the first round, prompting the promoter, Andy Jardine, to say he was so quick they called him Lightning Lee Murray. Mr Murray's successful debut led him to begin taking training for the MMA seriously. Mr Murray jogged around the Abbeywood estate and attended two gyms, London Shoot Fighters in the White City for wrestling and Peacock's Gym in Canning Town for boxing. Martin Bowers, who ran Peacock's Gym with his brothers Tony and Paul, described Mr Murray as a very nice boy who conducted himself well. Mr Bowers said that Mr Murray reminded him of many other young men who had seen come in his gyms over the years. Many of the men had come from troubled backgrounds but their lives were given structure and purpose by the sport of boxing. Notably, at the same time that Mr Murray was training at the Peacock's Gym, the Bowers brothers were planning a series of robberies, the biggest at being a brazen raid on a high security warehouse at Gatwick Airport. Their scheme involved disguising themselves as security officers, using a fake Brinks map van to get into the depot and then stealing £1 million in foreign currency. After Scotland Yard found out about the planned heist, all three brothers were arrested and jailed. It has been speculated that while Mr Murray had no prior knowledge about the robbery being planned, the schematics that were later revealed publicly may have given Mr Murray some of the ideas for his own robbery that were later used in the similar Securitas Depot robbery. Mr Murray had four professional fights in 2000. The first was a 12th of March encounter with Mr Mike Tomlinson who went under the banner of the Ring of Truth. Mr Murray won the fight via a Kimura submission in the first round. But it was in February 2004 that Mr Murray would expand on some of the events that were surrounding the fight. Writing on a message board in a now archived thread from the mixed martial arts website SureDog, Mr Murray told the story of watching the Prince Nassim Hamed vs Voyani Bungu fight at the pub at the night before his own match with Mike Tomlinson. When a fellow visitor to the pub stood in front of Mr Murray and then accused him of stealing his seat after being asked to move, Mr Murray allegedly knocked the man and his friend who attempted to aid him unconscious. This was followed up by knee strikes to knock out a bartender who rushed in to break up the fight. The following morning and on the day of his fight with Mike Tomlinson, Mr Murray was unable to close his left hand due to the damage he had caused in a barbell the night before. 
After taping the hand, Mr. Murray relied solely on his good right hand, stating that he caught Mr. Tomlinson with a few good rights. Mr. Murray was rocked, so Mr. Tomlinson took me down. Then I caught him in a key lock on the ground and won the fight. After that, I went to the hospital and got my hand plastered up. It was broken in two places. Mr. Murray's next two bouts took place on the 17th of June in 2000 in a tournament for a Extreme Challenge 34. Mr. Murray defeated his first opponent, Chris Albandia, by an ankle lock in the first round. Mr. Murray would later say that he thought Albandia was a kickboxer because he was wearing tie shorts, so he started the fight out with leg kicks. When Chris Albandia surprised Mr. Murray by performing a single leg takedown, Mr. Murray said he sprawled and took him to the side of the cage where I was kneeing Mr. Albandia and punching him consistently and constantly. Chris Albandia dropped again and took me down with him, going in for a leg lock on me, so I grabbed Mr. Albandia's leg and went to trade leg locks with him. I cranked an Achilles lock on him and I thought it must have snapped because there was a really loud crack. Even Pat heard it in my corner when Chris Albandia got up and he couldn't put weight on his leg. So I won that one, Mr. Murray said. The victory advanced Mr. Murray to the second round of the tournament, but Mr. Murray would lose by an armbar to the Canadian submission specialist Joe Dorickson in the opening round of the contest. Mr. Murray said that he went into the final, so I was happy and excited about winning the first. I just sort of lost my focus. Mr. Murray's next fight was just weeks later, on the 9th of July contest against Danny Rushton, a fighter who had gained a feared reputation for his toughness due to his competing in a true no holds barred competition in Russia. The match ended up in a no contest. However, Mr. Rushton collapsed in the first round due to exhaustion. At some point in 2000, Mr. Murray travelled to Iowa to train in the renowned Maltich Fighting Systems Camp run by former UFC welterweight champion Pat Maltich. On the 11th of March 2001, Mr. Murray fought to a draw against Chris Bacon at the Millennium Brawl 2 Capital Punishment. Mr. Murray then followed that fight up with a first round knockout of Gary Warren at Millennium Brawl 3 Independence Day on the 1st of July. On the 11th of September 2004, Lee Murray fought the future UFC and Hall of Famer middleweight champion Anderson the Spider Silva in a Cage Rage 8 for the vacant middleweight title. Anderson Silva had only won by unanimous decision after the fight went the distance, something that not many fighters have been able to do when stepping into the cage with Mr. Silva. During the time fighting, Mr. Murray amassed an 8-2-1 record overall in a smaller promotions before receiving a contract with the Ultimate Fighting Championship. In Mr. Murray's UFC debut, he defeated Jorge Riviera by triangle choke slash armbar in the first round. This was Mr. Murray's first and only fight in the UFC due to complications with his US visa. This happened as a result of the ongoing criminal prosecution which was currently underway against Mr. Murray in the UK for assault after he had attacked a man during a road rage incident. The complications led to Mr. Murray signing with the Cage Rage promotion, but his time here was also short lived due to his injuries resulting from a stabbing which prevented Mr. Murray from continuing his MMA career further. Witnesses also claim that Mr. Murray was involved in a scuffle with the then UFC light heavyweight champion Tito Ortiz outside a nightclub in London after UFC 38 in July 2002, in which Mr. Murray allegedly fought Mr. Ortiz. Mr. Murray asserts he knocked Tito Ortiz out and a claim which was later substantiated by Matt Hughes in his book Made in America, the most dominant champion in UFC history. On the page 168, the story was also confirmed by Pat Maltich during an interview with ESPN. Tito Ortiz, however, denies he was ever knocked out by Mr. Murray. Chuck Liddell also stated that he did not see Tito knocked out unconscious during the brawl. On the 28th of October 2005, Mr. Murray was hospitalised after being stabbed in a brawl during the birthday party of the British glamour model Lauren Pope. Mr. Murray suffered a punctured lung and a severed artery during the altercation. According to the doctor who performed the life-saving surgery on Mr. Murray, Mr. Murray was resuscitated four times during the operation that had luckily saved his life. When thanked, the doctor remarked that Mr. Murray should not thank him, but thank the nurses who ran the bags of blood from the blood bank, because it was that blood being delivered as quick as it was that had actually saved his life. The Securitas Depot robbery was a large heist in Tonbridge, Kent, England. 
It began with the kidnapping on the evening of the 21st of February 2006 at approximately half six GMT and ended in the early hours of February the 22nd. Mr. Murray and his criminal gang left the depot with over 53 million pounds in cash. It was the UK's largest cash robbery at the time and the gang had left behind another 154 million in cash only because they did not have the room to take it with them. After abducting the manager of the depot and his family at gunpoint at the family home, the gang forced entry into the depot. Armed with weapons including an AK-47 assault rifle and a Scorpion submachine gun, the gang tied up 14 members of staff and was able to leave with £53,116,760 in used and unused Bank of England sterling banknotes. Most of the getaway vehicles were found in the following week. One vehicle containing just over 1.3 million in stolen notes. Another £7 million in cash was recovered in Welling and by June 2006, over 30 people had been arrested in relation to the crime. At the trial in London, five people were convicted and received very substantial custodial sentences. Those sentenced for the robbery included Mr. Amir Heisenaj, who was the inside man and gave the gang the information they needed to carry out the heist. Lee Murray, the alleged mastermind of the heist, was arrested in Morocco after incriminating himself in a recording on his mobile phone. A phone in which it appears he accidentally had abandoned at the site of the car crash weeks before the robbery. He successfully fought extradition to the UK, proving his Moroccan heritage and eventually was imprisoned alternatively in Morocco. As of today, £32 million of the cash that was stolen has not been recovered. On Tuesday the 21st of February 2006, the manager of the Securitas Depot, Colin Dixon, was driving his silver Nissan Almera on the A249 at about half six in the afternoon. He was pulled over just outside Stockbury, a village northeast of Maidstone in Kent, by what he thought was an unmarked police car due to the flashing blue lights he had seen behind the front grill of the car. A man approached Mr. Dixon in high visibility clothing and Mr. Dixon got into the other car whereupon he was handcuffed. He was driven west on the M20 motorway to the West Mauling Bypass where he was tied up and transferred into a white van which took him to a farm in Staplehurst. At the same time, Mr. Dixon's wife and eight-year-old son were being taken hostage at their home in Hearn Bay after they answered the door to men dressed in police uniforms. The men claim Mr. Dixon had been involved in a car accident before abducting the two and holding them at Staplehurst Farm with the manager. Mr. Dixon was told at gunpoint that failure to cooperate would put him and his family in danger. At around 1am on Wednesday the 22nd of February 2006, Mr. Dixon, his wife and his son were taken in a white van to the Securitas Depot in Tonbridge. Upon being let in by Mr. Dixon, a member of the gang forced staff at gunpoint to open the gates to admit the van and other vehicles into the depot. The gang members' faces were hidden by balaclavas and they were armed with handguns, shotguns, AK-47 assault rifles and a Scorpion submachine gun. The Dixon family and 14 members of staff were tied up and locked in cash cages whilst the robbery took place. The gang filled a 7.5 ton white Renault lorry with £53,116,760 in used and unused Bank of England sterling banknotes. Another £154 million would not fit in the lorry and was left behind when the gang departed at around 2.15 in the morning. At 3.15am, staff managed to break free and triggered an alarm which called the police to the location. The hostages luckily were all unharmed and were left very shaken from the ordeal. The Bank of England was reimbursed with £25 million by Securitas that very same day and assured the public that Securitas would make up any additional losses for the money stolen. The following day on Thursday the 23rd of February 2006, Securitas and their insurers offered a reward of £2 million for any information about the heist. A reward in which Crime Stoppers stated was the largest ever to be offered for a crime at the time in the UK. Kent Police said the heist had been meticulously planned by organised criminals and that at least £20 million in cash had been stolen and possibly as much as £50 million. By the evening of 23rd of February 2006, two arrests had been made by the police in Forest Hill, South London. A man aged 29 and a woman aged 31 were both detained at separate houses and held on suspicion of conspiracy to commit robbery. 
A third person, a 41-year-old woman, was also arrested at a branch of the Portman Building Society in Bromley. This was on suspicion of handling stolen goods. Also on the same Thursday, the 23rd of June, the police discovered a number of vehicles that were involved in the robbery, including a formal parcel force van which was thought to have been used in the abduction of Colin Dixon and his family. The van was found abandoned at the Hook and Hatchet pub in the village of Huckling in a Maidstone. Mr Dixon's Nissan Almero was found in the car park of the Cock Horse pub in Detling. A Volvo S60 and a red Vauxhall Vectra, the cars believed to have been mocked up as police cars, were also found near Leeds Castle. The next day, Friday the 24th of February, metal cages thought to have been used to transport the money were recovered in a field near Detling. Police recovered a white Ford Transit van from the car park of the Ashford International Hotel after a tip-off from a member of the public. The van and its contents were removed for forensic examination on the 26th of February 2006. It was announced that the van contained £1.3 million along with guns, balaclavas and body armour. On the evening of Saturday 25th of February 2006, forensic teams and armed police officers raided the houses of Lee Russia and Jet Book Papa in Southborough near Turnbridge, Wells, while neither was at home. In Russia's house, police discovered shotgun shells and had also found hand-drawn plans of the depot that had been robbed. On the afternoon the next day, Kent police challenged Russia and Bukpapa in the street in Tankerton near Whitstable. They fled in a blue BMW 3 Series coupe. The car was halted after a chase and some witnesses say police marksmen shot out the tires of the car, while others say that a stinger device was used to bring the vehicle to a halt. The driver and another man were both arrested. On the 27th of February 2006, another two individuals were detained by police in Greenwich area of London by armed officers. The following day, the white 7.5 tonne Renault Midland lorry, believed to have been used to transport the stolen money during the robbery, was also recovered by the police. The same day, Kent police raided Elderdon Farm in Staplehurst area, conducting extensive forensic searches of the surrounding land and buildings, also seizing all vehicles on the land. On Thursday the 2nd of March, police raided a car yard in Welling and discovered £7 million in cash. On the same day, three people appeared at Maidstone Magistrates Court. John Fowler, a car dealer and the owner of Elderdon Farm, was charged with conspiracy to commit robbery, handling stolen goods and three charges of kidnapping. Stuart Royal was charged with conspiracy to commit robbery and Kim Shackleton was charged with handling stolen goods. All three were remanded in custody. Jetmir Bukpapa and Lee John Russia appeared in court on the 3rd of March, both charged with conspiracy to commit robbery. They were remanded in custody until a preliminary hearing at Maidstone Crown Court was to be held on the 13th of March. By the 3rd of March, the total number of people arrested in connection with the heist was now at 14. On the 25th of June in 2006, and in a joint operation with local police, Four British men were arrested at a shopping centre in Morocco's capital, Rabat, after a three-month-long investigation. Of the four arrested, only Lee Murray, a 26-year-old from Sidcup, South London, was wanted regarding the robbery. Kent police confirmed his arrest and stated that over 30 people had now been arrested as part of the investigation. By the year's end, police had asked the Home Office for at least £6 million towards expenditure so far investigating the case and future spending on preparations for trials. In December 2006, Sean Lupton, who had been released on bail, was recorded as missing, having failed to answer the conditions of his bail. The trial of eight people began on the 26th of June 2007 at the Old Bailey in London. The first three weeks of the trial focused on the role of the manager Colin Dixon, with the defence cross-examination highlighting coincidences in his conduct which might have been interpreted as suggesting that he was an inside man. In fact, the inside man had been Amir Heisenaj, an Albanian man who worked at the depot. He had secretly filmed its layout with a belt camera. Michelle Hogg, who had made prosthetic disguises for the men, decided during the trial to turn the Queen's evidence and implicate others in return for her charges being dropped. On the 28th of January 2008, the jury returned guilty verdicts on Stuart Royal, Yetmir Papa, Roger Coots, Lee Russia and Amir Heisenach. The next day, Amir Heisenaj was sentenced to 20 year in prison with an order to serve a minimum of 10 years. Stuart Royal, Lee Rush and Yetmir Papa and Roger Coots were given life sentences with an order to serve a minimum of 15 years. Stuart Royal, Lee Rush, Yetmir Papa 
and Roger Coots were given life sentences with an order to serve a minimum of at least 15 years. Prosecutors dropped the charges against Kim Shackleton, Raluca Millen and Chris Price and the girlfriends of Royal, Book Papa and Russia respectively. Millen and Katie Phillip had been charged with conspiracy to rob, conspiracy to kidnap and conspiracy to possess firearms. Shackleton had been charged with assisting an offender. John Fowler, on whose property some of the money was found, and Keith Borer were both acquitted. On the 20th of June in 2006, in a joint operation in collaboration with the Moroccan police, Mr Murray was arrested at a shopping centre in the Suissi district of the capital Rabat for suspected involvement in a Securitas Depot robbery. Moroccan police said they had to use specialist techniques to arrest the suspects because they were specialists in martial arts and firearms. Kent police said in a statement that they had been tracking Mr Murray for three months and would be seeking Mr Murray's extradition from Morocco. There is no treaty between the UK and Morocco and this process was expected to take months. Later, Moroccan police revealed that Mr Murray had also been charged with possession of hard drugs in Morocco. In June 2010, Lee Murray was jailed in Morocco for 10 years for his part in the robbery. The sentence was later increased to 25 years. The Kent Police Detective Superintendent Keith Judge said, I'm pleased Murray will now begin serving a significant prison sentence for his part in the Tombridge robbery. Former cage fighter Mr Murray was claimed by other gang members to have been the mastermind behind the heist. He is believed to have worn a prosthesis to impersonate one of the police officers who abducted Mr Dixon and to be the person dubbed Stopwatch by detectives. Caught on CCTV directing the robbers to move as fast as possible. After being arrested in Morocco, Mr Murray successfully fought extradition to the UK on account of his father being Moroccan. To this day, £32 million of the cash has not been recovered. The missing money was covered by insurance however. Securitas no longer handles cash and sold the Vale Road Depot to Voltrex, a company owned jointly by Barclays and HSBC. In the opinion of a former detective superintendent, the cash will have a long ago disappeared into an organised crime network. Kane Patterson, whom the police and CPS believe to be a key player in both the robbery and kidnapping, still remains missing and is thought to be residing in the West Indies with a large quantity of the stolen money. Paul Allen was shot and severely injured on the 11th of July in 2019 at his home in North London. He was taken to hospital in a critical condition. An attempt to escape Soleil prison in Morocco was made by Mr Murray. Small saws were found in a plate of biscuits in Mr Murray's cell by another prisoner who had broken into it. Prison officials believed that Mr Murray was planning to cut through the iron bars of his cell windows with those saws. To make the escape through the small window of Mr Murray's cell easier, Mr Murray had lost a significant amount of weight in order to fit through. Mr Murray was in a different cell at the time as punishment for being caught with a laptop computer with internet access and 5 kilos of drugs. Other prisoners in Soleil held it against Mr Murray that he was able to use his money and notoriety to smuggle in items like this, as well as expensive clothes. The fellow prisoner who broke into Mr Murray's cell was doing so to steal some of Mr Murray's belongings. Time Inc. announced on the 4th of August 2008 they would be making a film about Lee Murray's alleged role in the robbery, based on an article about Mr Murray in Sports Illustrated called Breaking the Bank. In addition to the robbery, the film will also concentrate on Mr Murray's life, including his mixed martial arts career, where he notably faced the likes of Jorge Riviera, Jose Landi, Gary Warren, Chris Bacon, Danny Rushton, Joe Dorkson, Chris Albandia, Mike Tomlinson, Rob Hudson, and the most famously, the legendary Hall of Famer Anderson the Spider Silva. One thing is for sure, from fighting at a high level to the crimes he committed, Lee Murray is a name that will never be forgotten about in the UK criminal underworld. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a like and a share, and leave any thoughts or suggestions you have in the comments section. We love to read through them all. And if you're new but enjoy UK true crime content, then subscribe to see when our newest video releases. And as always, stay safe.